offices, I think is doing them an injustice because the self is a lot more resilient, a lot more vast and a lot more complex. And if we're ignoring everything else, um, I think that creates a really interesting dynamic that we're going to talk about a little um, later on. But does that kind of answer the question? Absolutely. That's really helpful. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And it's not that it's a good or a bad thing to try to, you know, um, have these shortcuts. It, this really wasn't like a judgmental thing. Like, do you see your client? Like, this is a really difficult thing that we have to do. And I think what's important for me and a check-in for me as a therapist is like the switch from what to who in a session. Okay. What did they just say? Okay, what did their behavior? Okay, what do they need? Okay, what they what do they want? It's like the what, what, what questions. And I think sometimes it's a really nice reframe when I go, who is sitting in front of me? Who is asking for this? Who is struggling with this? And I think that that's just like a really interesting fun reframe that when you're not feeling bogged down <laughs> with the caseload, you can try and see if it changes how you um engage with your client. Um, I think that when we don't do that, we, we are sometimes subpar in the way that we conduct therapy, which you know what, we can't be a hundred percent all the time and that's okay. And sometimes we miss the biggest, bigger issue, uh, when we don't ask the who question. So sometimes we're like, yay, we, we, they're asymptomatic now. <laughs> and that person is still in absolute chaos with their existence. And something that we've seen, for example, moral injury, I'm not sure how many people um, have studied the concept of moral injury, but um, it started off within the military context. And what we were seeing is the veterans were coming back from war and they had PTSD and the suicide rates were just so high. And in 2009, the coin moral injury came about. And what they realized was, although they were treating and targeting PTSD symptoms, the, the um, suicide rates did not decrease. Why? They, were, they didn't have symptoms anymore. They should be cured. They should be happy. They should live on and they just weren't and they understood after some research that this thing called moral injury was the variable that they were missing and it's almost like the who that they were missing because moral injury is all about the value the essence the self the understanding of who you are and that as a being you were transgressing your own morals and values maybe unfortunately you know um as you were like deployed and it was on a command of someone else and you felt like you had no choice. But I think what they were showing is like, they missed the who altogether. Um, and obviously we didn't know moral injury existed and now we do, and it's still really difficult to pin down and treat. And so that's not like, a, they missed it. Like it was almost impossible to find, but I think that's a really good example of like, we treated the symptoms and the who still felt so lost that they found no point in living. And so, um, yeah, that's what I like to kind of use as an example. Um, I said the word self-loss, so let's get into it. <laughs> we're going to be um, talking a little bit about the self, and then we're going to be talking about self-loss and why self-loss is really important um, in clinical practice. Um, and how it can sometimes help us tackle main, like uh, very common therapeutic issues um, in maybe a slightly more holistic way. Okay, so what is the self? This is an interesting question. Um, again, I want you to take a couple minutes and maybe in the Q and A's, actually, you can not ask me a question, but tell me, like, how do you define a client? Let's first do that. Like, how do you define a client? How do you define a person? And then how do you define the self? I'd be really interested if anyone has any definitions they want to offer. <laughs> I know they're... they're they're kind of difficult, but you know, we all say we work with clients. So how do you define a client? Um, so if anyone is willing to share, I would love to hear from you. 
I am with, oh, here we go. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Self, I define using the eight C's of IFS. Love it. Amazing. Anyone else? I'll play along while we're waiting. So what yeah. is the self? Um, how do I define the self? Um, I think of the self of like who you really are deep in mm -hmm. inside that often gets clouded by the things that happen in life. Absolutely. I love that. Here we go. Um, uh, this says client, someone seeing me in therapy, client is searching for the self. Ooh. The self is our being full of connection. The, the self, Sarah, you'll re relate to this one. The self, um, as who you are at 3 AM. <laughs> I love that. That was me last night. <laughs> yeah. There's jet lag. Um, yeah. Client is who shows up. Self is what is deeper that may not be realized yet. Um, here's a person one. Person. Client is a person. Other people are people not seeing me in therapy. Love that. That's a really clear, beautiful distinction. Yeah. Uh, self is a mental re uh, representation, who we authentically are. Um, there's a quote here. Who were you before the world told you who to be? Oh, good. Okay. These are making me excited. Okay. Oh, Sarah, I, I'm sorry. I think you cut out for a second. Are you there? Amazing. Oh, so okay. there you are. The client, I am here because my internet connection is unstable. We can hear you though. I apologize. Oh, there you are. Am I back? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Do you want to read a couple more? Did I, I just want to make sure people are feeling heard? That's what we want is people yes, to feel absolutely. heard. <laughs> um, okay. What do we see here? There you go. Self is the one that wants to be heard. Um, Ooh, yeah. <laughs> the part of you that was never born and has never died. Um, Self, however individuals define that for themselves. Um, client is the presenting issue. Person is all the other parts of their life that come into play. Self is the core human strengths and abilities. Wow, oh, that's beautiful. Johari's window is a good example. It's the hidden part of us often not knowing actually. I'm not familiar with that. Hmm. Um, we have some research to do. <laughs> yes. Capacity for consciousness that enables us to make choices. Um, self is the core of who we really are underneath all the human experience. Um, oh, here's a kid uh, oriented one. When I work with kids, I ask, what is the scariest thing you've ever seen? And what's the funniest thing you've ever seen? Oh, I love that. Yeah. Um, I mean, so they are rolling in. I could keep going, but it might. I mean, I think you should go a little more. I feel like okay, this is really important. More. And it's important to see how our colleagues understand the self and how it's kind of different for everyone. Yes, it is so cool. We all do similar things. And yet this answer is so different. Mm -hmm. um, the self cannot be defined as the self is a being of light, love, and energy with almost mm -hmm. unlimited possibilities. I like that. Yeah. Um, just scrolling. Um uh person, who do you believe you are? Um, self, the me inside, truly authentic with no masks. Mm. Mm. Self is a person that was not seen in my childhood. Wow. Uh, let's see the biopsychosocial spiritual being. Mm. Um, the representation self is the representation of what we were 
are and we want to be as a whole. That's beautiful. Client, someone who is asking me to help them in some way along their journey in life. Mm -hmm. Client, what we show those willing to listen and see. Mm -hmm. uh, Self-defined as the understanding of one's own nature or determination of one's own nature or basic qualities. Mm. These are so good. They are. The self is the meta self-reflective awareness. That's a big one. That's a big one. I want to hear more. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. Self is the person who manages to get out of bed in the morning. Mm. I like that. It's so good. Okay. Um, okay. Here's a big one. Self is the composite parts of an individual, some parts of which are known to them and others are not. The evolution of the individual over time impacted by every experience, interaction, quality, and trait. Sounds very similar to I'm going to define it. <laughs> All right. So let's hear your definition, Sarah. This is so good. Thank you, everyone, for engaging. The reason why I think it's so powerful is because we all do the same things, similar things, I should say. We all have the goal of assisting individuals. We all understand the self of the individuals there, yet all we see the self in a slightly different way. And I think this is where really powerful, interesting conversations can happen and where we can learn from one another. And I'm just going to backtrack a little bit of like, how do I define a client? So I define a client as someone who is receiving services from a therapist. Um, how do I, for example, define a person, um, a human being regarded as an individual? I took that from, I don't know, a, a dictionary. Cause I was like, how do you define a person? And then how do you define the self? This is what lights my world. Um, the self is something we create with the choices we make and the sense of responsibility with which we approach our existence and the way we use our freedom despite our constraints yes i read that it's from my book and i just wanted to make sure i articulated that well the self is a constant creation and the only way we create it is through the way we show up and the way that we show up is uh, guided by our freedom, our choices, and our responsibility. And I'm going to talk about those three ingredients. This is the least sexy and appealing view on the self. And I admit that. Um, but I think it's a really important one. I think I personally refrain from using the language of find yourself because to me that's more essentialism essentialism believes that there is a self that's given to you and it is your duty to go and find it um and you can either succeed or fail at that while in existentialism you first exist and then you create the essence then you create the self there is no essence that's given to you that then you grasp and i think that makes people really uncomfortable and it's not it doesn't feel good but I do think it gives us so much freedom. So when people say, I'm going to find myself, I really wonder what they're looking for. Like who has constructed this essence that they're now finding? Um, that's kind of where my attention is. And, you know, we look at it as going to a closet, baking out a sweater is the metaphor I use all the time, putting it on, being like, this is me. Also kind of, um, alludes to the fact that it is it's static that the self is static and what i like about existentialism is that it does not even remotely allude to that and it's saying you literally create yourself as you go and yourself it heidegger um talks about design and what i loved about that is like yourself is constantly molded we're having this conversation right now the fact that i I'm talking and can't see your faces is impacting me in some sort of way. And the fact that you're listening to my words, you can agree or disagree is still impacting you some sort of way. And now you are a different, slightly different version of yourself than you were before. And I think when we think about the self as that malleable, 
it is really, really fun because if you woke up today being like, I don't like myself, I don't recognize myself, I don't want to be myself, the answer is you don't have to. How freaking cool. If you manage to create a version of yourself that you detest even or don't respect or don't like, that means you have the equal power to create the self that you do. And I think that that's some of the most empowering stance on the self uh, rather than like you're meant to be this and now you're either going to succeed or fail and we don't really care if you wanted to be that in the first place and you know we're going to make mistakes and we're going to have versions of ourselves that we don't like but the cool thing is that it, you take ownership you go this was my mistake this was my version and there's something really empowering even about making a mistake that will hopefully lead you to a self that you do want and so this is a message of empowerment when i talk to clients about the self it's always like it is um it is art you get to paint the canvas and at no point will it be blank again you're going to be constantly layering but you get to decide what the final picture looks like um, and I think that that's really cool. There isn't an eraser when you're watercoloring something or oil painting something from my understanding and same with life, there is no eraser, but you can paint over it and you can make, you know, art out of even really painful experiences. And so something that uh, people get hung up on is I think the self is how you show up in the world. So it is the result of how we manage our responsibility, freedom, and choices. These three words you're going to hear a lot for the next hour. Um, and I don't believe you can be anything other than what you are right now. So this is where people have resistance. What I mean is how you're showing up right now is who you are. We always like to be like, well, I'm this, but right now I'm not really showing up as myself. In reality, you are however you show up. So people will be like, I'm so patient. I'm so kind. I'm so nice. I'm so great. And that is how they conceptualize themselves. And that's who they are. Then you see them in a car or you see a client. <laughs> but let's let's make this personal. You see them in a car. They're honking. They're swearing. They're flipping people off. And in that moment, who are they? Are they who they thought they were? Or are they the person that is not patient in that moment and not kind in that moment. And I think it's really, really interesting because in those moments we have two options. And this is what I tell my clients. When there is a lack of alignment between how you perceive yourself and who you really, uh, or how you're acting, you have two options. One, you can change how you think about yourself. You can go, actually, you know what? I am not a patient person and I don't deal well with stress when it comes to traffic. And that's okay. I'm changing the perception of myself because I've seen my actions and they reflect to me someone different than who I thought I was. So you change the belief. The other option is to change your action. You go, okay, it really resonates with me to be patient and kind. Um, and my actions do not reflect that. Therefore, my actions have to change. But there is that disconnect. And as long as there is that disconnect, we're going to have a really hard time pinpointing the self. And the self happens in the alignment. Um, I also, someone said something about um, like the endless possibilities or who you're going to become. And I love it because existentialism does talk about that. Kierkegaard in particular talks about how the self straddles the the necessity and the possibility and Sartre later calls it like the givens so necessities mean we straddle everything that that has been given to us by life so we have to live we have to die we have to eat and anything that's happened in our past for example is a given because you can't change it and that becomes a part of who we are and then the possibilities are all the ways in which we can grow and change and evolve and all the things that will happen and have not happened. And what I love about that is that we will be in a situation of like, I don't think we can look in a mirror and go, this is who I am. I think we can look in a mirror and go, this is who I am right now. And that's really cool. I think that talks about the perpetual becoming that we talked about in the definition an hour ago. Um, and I think, you know, 
Kierkegaard's theory and Sartre's theory really kind of lean into that perpetual becoming um, and the fact that, you know, our selves are boundless and we will never technically become it because more is yet to come. And so we get glimpses of it by the way we decide to um, show up in the world. And there's no ultimate destination that we can reach. We kind of get to decide what that ultimate destination is. Um, I just want to ask for questions. I want to pause here and get people to ask questions if there are any before I kind of talk a little more about the self because I just gave a lot of information clearly. I was lit up because about the self um, or, you know, how I have conceptualized the self through existentialism. Please ask. And if you don't, I will proceed. Okay, we've got lots of questions. Um, so uh, there is a question from okay, Janessa. Cool. Yeah, there's a question from Janessa. Do you think this framework works with any group? Uh, I'm thinking doing this with teenagers or early life stages could create further anxieties. Mm hmm. Yeah, we know that freedom induces some good dose of anxiety. Um, yes and no. I think a, a little bit about it is the presentation. The way I'm presenting it now is very different than how I would present it to a teenager. Um, and I think the teenager feeling that they have to be a certain way is paralyzing, that this could almost offset that of like, there is no wrong way to be. Um, and you can choose to be whoever you want to be. And then in your, when you go to college, you can be a different version of yourself and so I think depending of how it's framed and how it's communicated it could be very liberating I do understand the the fact that you know teenagers are not so keen or aware of responsibility and freedom they have in life and and how important their decisions are but I also think that that's something we should be educating them of like every decision that you make has really real consequences um, and so I think as as long as the language is adjusted a little bit and and it's more the positive outcome of something like this, rather than maybe focusing on like the responsibility uh, aspect of it, I do think it can be used like a like a framework. And I think saying there's no wrong way to be yourself for any teenager would be would be pretty great, but I could be wrong. That's my initial thoughts. I don't know, Anna, if you have any thoughts. No, I mean, I think that that makes a lot of sense. A lot of times I think our our um, our answers to these questions are, it depends, right? Yeah. Like there's so many situational things that can play a role. There is a, a couple of like, follow-up questions related to this that I'll jump to. Um, you know, wondering what adapting this might look like for folks with intellectual delays or um, if there are certain diagnoses you would not use this with. Yeah, great questions. Um, yeah, as much as I love existential therapy, I also am not oblivious or delusional to think that this is the ideal therapy for everything. And I think there's no therapy that's absolutely great for everything. Um, I think that, um, oh, this is a long conversation. So all I'm going to say is, yes, th there is definitely hesitations of if an individual is going to have a hard time grasping the concepts in a way that's actually going to be helpful rather than overwhelming, I'm not going to use it. If there's individuals that are going to weaponize something like this, I'm not going to use it. And so I think that has to come in discretion. And to be quite frank, I don't often uh, teach my clients all the things behind the self. I think it's just something that I know and my my sort of stance is to empower them to realize how much their choice is. Sometimes that's as subtle as going like, wow, let's really reflect how you've changed this last year. It's the same, you know, it's the same framework, but the way that I'm using it is so minimal. And it's just pointing out to the clan like, wow, this is amazing. You couldn't even imagine a year ago that you'd be, you know, thinking this or acting this way. And that's really cool because then they go, wow, I've really changed and I can change. And so as long as I get to the point where they feel empowered by this fluidity of the self, I don't always explain it to this extent. 
Um, and I, you know, if it is something that's going to be maybe weaponized, I am very cautious not to um, hand the weapon. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, also related, I know sort of a limitation of our field in general is that we do not always have great representation in our studies that help us to develop these concepts. Uh, so there is a question of how this, how does this work for minorities or min or uh, marginalized groups? Yeah, so it's a great question. And you're so right. Like, it's just, I think it's um, the way that we've really let down our field. And I think it'd be really meaningful to conduct research. I think there is hubris in existentialism in terms of like, we're talking about the human condition. <laughs> and it's like, there's a massive umbrella. And although, you know, there is some truth to that, I, I think being really um aware of lack of some of studies in the minority groups is really important but i also think that as therapists it's our jobs to empower minority groups and give them a louder voice and and um allow them to take up more space and i think that some components of existentialism are really like go and grasp life and be as big as you want and and dare to do it and i think that that hopefully to some extent can be empowering but i would be really interested to see studies on it as well um and i think more should be conducted for sure um let's see uh there's just so many good questions um okay here we go let's see um hmm uh okay there are some predictable times that these issues can appear during the lifespan um identity in early adulthood midlife uh etc are there particular time particular times in the phases of people's lifespan that you find this particularly helpful oh that's a really good question um you know in your 20s <laughs> when people are grasping with the self but what I find it particularly interesting is like that phase right before a midlife crisis, because we always think of the midlife crisis as the crisis, but there were years, if not a decade leading up to that crisis. So I actually find that early 30s, late 20s, early 30s is when a lot of this hits. And a part of that is because we're conditioned to want certain things and to achieve certain goals. And in our early 30s, we start to do that. We become, we get married, we buy a house, I don't know, we get a kid, we get the job we wanted, or we finally finish school. Um, and then we go, okay, cool, now what? <laughs> and I think our tasks and our goals um, sort of blinded us to the fact we haven't developed a sense of self or weren't very conscious about developing a sense of self. And then when we get those things, we feel like there's a massive void. And so that in particular is an interesting population that I find it happens a lot with. And it's usually people that really feel like they have it together um, and that appear like they have it together and are praised by society and uh, awarded by society that struggle the most because they feel like they have the most confines and limitations on their self because I'm good as I am. I should not be moving because I'm getting all the opportunities, all the privileges, all the praise, all the belonging. So I need to just stay still. And then they just endure their own existence. They endure their like imposed sense of self. And so that's a really interesting one that I am finding um, coming out more frequently. But Gen Zers in general, I think are are a demographic that has shown to struggle with an existential crisis or an identity crisis uh, more specifically and so i think we're going to be seeing a large increase in in popularity of exist of existential questions and probably therapy i mean the barbie movie is probably a really great indication that's coming you know and that's sometimes that was like um, memes on existential crises and made my heart happy. But I, I do think that Gen Zers in particular are really grasping with like the question of who am I a lot earlier on. Hmm. Um, I, to, to that point, that there was a comment earlier that was about uh, 
climate change also being something that seems to be leading to this existential crisis. Are you finding that as well? Yeah, a lot of my clients are really, um, and friends, I'm not even going to, so many people are really anxious about their existence because it is threatened. And we have, you know, a lot of news and, and scientific findings that it is actually threatened by collective actions. And they feel really powerless um, to do anything. And I think that that's an interesting one when it's more of a global issue. If it's all about empowerment and doing your part, but you can't do everyone's part, there is a, a, a lot of work in um, acceptance. And also, why does death scare you so much? I guess is the follow up question to something like that. Um, but yeah, I am finding that um, global warming is weighing heavy on a lot of people and causing a lot of anxiety about their existence and about making the best of their time and showing up in a certain way. Um, you want to take one more? You want to keep going? What would you like to do? We can take one more and then I think we can finish the slide before we take a little break seam. Okay. Um, so again, I know there's tons of questions that are coming in. They're really great. Um, and we will do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, and I'll try to summarize some as, I, as, um, as they relate as well. There are a couple questions about um, using existential psychotherapy with substance use or addictions. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, there's actually a couple of really good articles out. Um, I want to remember the author's name, but one of the authors is co-authored by Alfred Langley, who is the father of existential analysis. He personally worked with Viktor Frankl. They started existential analysis together before Frankl died and then developed it into what it is today. So if you look up his work, they do talk about addiction. There's also a super fascinating like YouTube clip of, I think, Gabor Mate and Alfred debating the addiction and their understanding of addiction. But in short, um, I think they really focus on lack of connection and value and the saying yes to life um, when it comes to um, battling uh, with addiction. I think responsibility is a touchy topic when it comes to addiction. I think it really depends on your um, perspective of what addiction is. So I specifically am not an addiction counselor, so I don't want to speak to it too much, but I know for a fact that a lot of existential therapists do use the framework for addiction. I just don't want to misspeak because that's not my specialty. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Something that I like to tell my clients is when we talk about the self as being static, they like that concept. And I think it gives them a lot of safety. And they feel like if they crack the code, then they don't have to keep doing the hard work. It's like you ran the marathon and now you're done. And then when I go keep running, they look at me like I'm like, what do you want from me? Um, and so uh, the metaphor that I give is think about it this way. It's possible to shatter a rock and it's impossible to break water. So many people's idea of the self is like a rock, something that must be formed, it must be set, and it must be unmovable because that's how we preserve it. That's how we protect the self. It's unmovable and it's strong. And you know, I say, and yet the self is more like water. It's flowing, it's changing, it's navigating around the things in its path. And if you think scientifically, water can erode rock and there is a lot of power in water. And I say your fluidity is your power, not your weakness. And there is something so unsettling about not being to go, this is it. Uh, in our mind, we like to categorize things. An ongoing project, I don't know if there's anything more exhausting for your mind than an ongoing thing you have to think about every single day. Um, I particularly love to work on like a big project. Doesn't matter how big or scary, but if I'm like, I'm just working on that one thing. But when I have something that it's like, I have to do this every day and I have to remember to do it every day and it's an ongoing thing, that's when it becomes really stressful. And so people want to be like, check, 
this is who I am. It's filed away. And then I have to break it to them that that's not how we function. But I think that comparison of rock and water can be really helpful, particularly for those who have felt like they have to be so strong in their life. They've gone through such difficult things um, and that their strength saved them and preserved them. And they went into self-preservation. And I feel like I can really resonate with that in my early childhood going through, you know, um, war experiences. I lived in self-preservation until I was in my mid twenties. I couldn't fathom that I was not no longer experiencing a threat. I didn't know that there was another way to exist. I was not prioritizing self-awareness or self-expression. And that's why myself was so compromised. And so I totally get people that need to feel like they're a rock, but I think those people are holding on so tightly and that is so exhausting. And again, that's more coping and enduring life rather than living it. So allowing your client to kind of let go and be moved by that current, be moved by that fluidity and know that they're going to stay afloat. I think that that can be incredibly healing for, for clients. And so something I like to say is, what is the self? Many of us waste our life never knowing who we are. I genuinely mean this. It is a waste. We constantly speak or act on, beha on behalf of the self, yet most of us do not know ourselves intimately enough to do so. The reason I'm, I'm sharing this quote is because next time you hear a client say, I am or myself, um, Sometimes it can be really fun to just pause the conversation and inquire about that. It's like, what did you mean by myself? Who is the self that you're talking about? Um, and I always compare that not knowing who you are is like watching a movie that you don't know who the main character is. Um, and so you don't know the character development you don't really understand the plot line you don't understand the movie you don't understand what the point of the movie is even and so it's so important for your client to understand who is the self who is this movie about and what character am I following throughout this narrative called life we're gonna start this very we're going to unleash your inner existentialist <laughs> And when I think about this, the key ingredients of self, it's like a cake, it's dense, it's sweet. Um, it's a cake maybe you don't want to eat, but it's, it's hopefully helpful. And I think about the three ingredients of the self being freedom, responsibility, and choice. And let's talk about freedom before we take a break. Freedom, what does it mean? So again, I'm going to engage you all. Just one last time before the break, what does it mean to be free? Because again, I'm throwing around this vocabulary and I think it's actually now that I'm hearing myself, it's so important that we are using the vocabulary the exact same way. Uh, that's going to become progressively more important throughout this workshop because I think as psychology has popularized and become more mainstream, um, it has also diluted in its meaning um, around certain words, such as authenticity coming next. So let's talk about what does it mean to be free? What is freedom? What am I even talking about? Why would freedom be the ingredient of life? So when you think about you being free, something being free, what does it mean? I would love to hear your responses. Because again, as the self-talk um, proved, we all think slightly differently and we use words in a different way. So I don't know if Anna is open to reading some comments on freedom. I'm really, I'm really getting your support today. <laughs> oh, I'm ha I, again, I want to be able to be the voice for the, for the people that are joining us. So this is a great way for us to make that happen. Um, okay. So let's see, where do we start? I think I missed one freedom. Uh, one has the agency to make decisions and to act spaciousness and availability to shift perspectives about experiences of self and other mm. um fearless expression ooh <laughs> that should be a t-shirt <laughs> right um freedom can mean letting go yes mm -hmm. freedom feeling like 
I'm sorry, feeling that any choice, no matter how difficult, is possible. Love that. Um, I'm going to start jumping a little bit to try and capture people who write in at different times. The ability uh, to express self-determination, mm -hmm. the freedom to choose to do what needs to be done, yeah. free will question mark. Ooh, mm. okay. Different debate. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And next, next um, workshop. <laughs> yeah. Um, freedom can choose and act regardless of circumstances or other people's behaviors and words. Mm. Uh, let's see. Uh, being able to make choices, the right to be wrong. Um, Ooh, the right to be wrong. Yeah. Interesting. Ability to live and express authentically without limits from others. Ooh, that would be a nice world. Yeah. Owning your own movement. Mmm. <laughs> Autonomy, standing in power with no, uh, not constrained by power over. Mmm. Um, freedom is the human right to express yourself and live out your needs, wants, desires, passions in life. Mm. Yeah. Mm, I got to say this one because it's funny. Retirement, LOL. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. I love that. Um, okay. The ability to be vulnerable and safe. Mm, oof, yeah. Okay. Um, freedom is loving whatever comes up. Mm. Uh, being true to yourself. Um, That's an interesting one. I like that. Yeah. No longer being restrained to things that have tied you down. You want me to keep going? Or are we good? Ooh, you guys are good. Things. I mean, I feel like I have, yeah. unleashed, I have unleashed people's inner existentialist and this is making me so happy. No, seriously, thank you okay. so much for everyone that writes in. Like it just, it enriches this experience. Uh, it puts a big smile on my face and I absolutely love it. So before I give you my definition of freedom, I will give you uh, what Sartre wrote about freedom. He said, freedom is what we do with what is done to us. So we are our choices. And I love that because the second you go, you're free, then people go, well, all these things have happened to me. How can I possibly be free? Because I have real constraints and all of us to one degree or another have real constraints. And what he's saying is you're free within your constraints. So he's not asking you to be free infinitely free because that would be unreasonable but within what has happened to you what has you know what life has given you you can still choose freedom and you know there victor frankl talks a lot about freedom and he's lived in some of the worst imaginable context in in the concentration camp but arguably he had no freedom yet he fights for the concept that we always have freedom and sometimes that freedom is just the freedom of your attitude or the meaning you make of that situation so what that freedom looks like ebbs and flows um it's not always large and audacious and and um what we would naturally categorize as free but i think this is a more realistic representation of like hey we're free within what life gives us and and how do we recognize that freedom and how do we use it because sometimes we get so discouraged by the constraints that we lose sight that we're still free in some capacity so um i wrote for me freedom is the ability and responsibility of an individual to choose their own actions and values so freedom is our ability to choose our actions and our values. Um, and that's how I operate and that's how this presentation will operate. And that's how I teach my clients about what freedom is. Um, 
I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but you're sitting in a therapy session and the client is acting like they have zero freedom over anything. And I get it because I've personally done that. <laughs> or you're talking to a friend or a colleague and it's like, this is the worst thing ever. And and they're not, they're not suggesting that they're free to make a different choice or responsible to make a different choice. They're just saying like, this is how it is and I just must sit in it. And sometimes I like to push those limits um, in a really kind and gentle way. But it's like, you're talking to me about the fact you hate your marriage. Everyone's been there. Sure. But you are free to leave. And then there's arguments of like, well, no, because it would be financially so difficult. Or, you know, uh, we would, I don't know, I'd miss them too much. Or it would be so shameful for my family. All of these things are true, but is it true? And not always, by the way. So this is very particular and contextual, but is it true that, for example, this person, they could pack up and leave? Yes, people would not like them. Yes, their children would be upset. I'm not saying these consequences are good or even worthy of the choice. What I'm saying is that we need to acknowledge that that option exists. The reason why it's important to acknowledge that that option exists is so that they can feel like they're actually choosing to do whatever they're choosing rather than feel forced to do what they're choosing to do. And it's the taking responsibility of like, I understand that I'm actually free to not hand in my assignment. I'm free not to forgive. I'm free to do all these things. And yet I'm choosing to do this other thing because I think he holds the most value. And that brings them into that ownership rather than being um, passive or feeling like a victim to life. Although it's not an ideal maybe circumstance for them. I think there is like an element of ownership when you go, you have all these options. You're not choosing to take them sometimes because the consequences are sometimes because it doesn't align with you but i want you to know that your inaction sometimes is an action and it is a choice and it's how you're choosing to use your freedom and i think that that can be a really kind of interesting and really powerful reframe um something that i you know tell other therapists to do is like get in the habit of asking clients what they are free to do and, and some of them can be like really out there, like they would never do it, but they're free to do it. So it's like, whatever their problem is, I, I want to sit down and be like, what are you free to do? Let's list all the options. And then let's talk about the choices that you're making with your ability to have this freedom. And I think that that can, again, shift it from a push to a pull and get them more aware of just how free they are in their context. And again, we want to emphasize this, they're not always that free. And there are contexts that are super restrictive, but a lot of the time people are more free than they think they are. Um, the other question that I think is so helpful in a therapeutic setting is, do you feel free to be yourself? How often do we phrase it in the freedom context? Do you feel free to be yourself? And the question, if they say no, not really, is what do you think is limiting your freedom? So what is preventing you from being yourself? Um, do you really not have the freedom or does the freedom scare you? Does it make you anxious? Is it a little too much for you? And so um, this is where I'm going to leave you for a break. <laughs> but then when we come back, I do want to hear your questions about freedom. It's such an important concept, especially in therapy, where we believe in active change and the human capacity for change. And so I'm curious to see if you have any questions regarding the freedom component that we talked about. But when I say freedom is a key ingredient of the self. I think individuals need to understand that they're free before they can truly create the self. But yes, Anna, break time? Yes, uh, we will take a break. We will be back uh, at 3 p.m. Central. So adjust your your time zone accordingly. We'll see you in about 14 minutes. 2, 2, PM, 2 p.m. Central. Oh, 2 p.m. Central. I'm in the <laughs> East Coast time. Well, don't listen to me. Listen to AJ, 2 p.m. Central. I'll see you all soon. <laughs>
Hello, everybody. Just going to give everyone a second to come back. Being prompt. Yay, I'm seeing thumbs up, heart emojis, hearts. Cool. Um, I'm so excited to keep going because this is where the fun begins. I feel like this is kind of the meat of it all, the practicality of it all. So I'm really, really excited. And I hope you're equally excited. And uh, keep in mind, I can't see you, but I'm just going to envision you're all smiling at me. Um, before we move on from freedom, I am curious if anyone has any questions or comments they would like to make. So I really want this to kind of be a safe space. I think freedom is a weird thing to talk about in therapy, and I haven't done it the first couple of years of being a therapist. And even now I find myself trying to navigate that conversation. So if you have any questions, if you have any comments, please let me know um, before we move on to responsibility and choice, before it gets even more juicy. <laughs> um, there, there are. So um, let's go with this one first. Uh, so this is, this is a comment, but I think it would be a great thing to hear your, uh, your reflection mm -hmm. on. So Heather said um, in domestic abuse, often they do not have freedom of choice. Children in abusive homes often do not have freedom of choice. Oh my God. Yeah. And that is so important. And I think this is why I started with Sartre's quote of like freedom to what has been done to us. And that freedom in that context looks very different than someone who's just unhappy in their marriage and might have the freedom to leave. And in this context, they don't have the freedom. And so I think trying to figure out what is this individual still free to do is where the work begins. And I know it's like towing a fine line because you don't want to seem insensitive where you're like, but you still have freedom because that is not what this conversation is about. It's acknowledging how horrible the situation is, how unfair it is, how painful it is, what freedoms have been taken away. And then having that really difficult conversation of like, what freedom remains, even if it comes to like self-talk and meaning making and attitude. And those are sometimes feel really thin, thin freedoms. But I think unless we feel free as humans, that is psychologically really threatening. So helping a client still free, feel free, like I still get to choose what kind of shampoo I like. They get to exercise some kind of freedom. So I think, you know, in, in really severe context like this, it's um, it's about finding the small things and allowing them to feel a sense of agency, even though largely their freedoms have been taken away. And we can acknowledge that and validate that and empathize with that. So I hope that that kind of um, addresses that comment. But yeah, absolutely. We're not going to walk around pretending everyone has ultimate freedom. We can just leave and do whatever they want. Because for a lot of people, that's just not the case. And so I think you need to gauge your client's um, context um, and what they're open to hear and not hear and um, work within their constraints. Um, and like sort of a similar lane of like, what does freedom look like in certain situations? Um, <clears throat> there was a, a comment earlier and then there's this one. Um, so I'm going to pull the two together. Situations like infertility, um, uh, major medical conditions where, you know, it's terminal, uh, loss of a limb, things that are, that are sort of out of your control. It, this, this sort of theme seems to be about the body specifically. Um, what about freedom in those situations? I don't know if you would feel comfortable speaking to that at all with, your experience and um, maybe sharing a little bit about your experience and did you find any sort of freedom or did you even think about freedom in those contexts would freedom have come off as completely insensitive um, as a topic of conversation so I think yes. I would love to hear your honest opinion on this Okay, so for context, Sarah and I talked about this ahead of time and I'll I'll uh, fill you all in what she's asked asking about. So I am a uh, relatively recent breast cancer survivor, uh, started about, uh, or I was treated four years ago. And um, I wrote about it in the magazine, Psychotherapy Networker. Uh, so it's 
out there for all to see if you're interested. Um, and it was a very challenging experience. Thank you all for your emojis. Um, yeah, sweet. And that article is amazing. I cried when I read it. So if you really is a very moving article and I hope you all all read it. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, you know, if freedom was hard. I mean, did I feel that I had the freedom to choose not to do treatment? Like, theoretically, yes. Um, would I have chosen that? I had a three-year-old son at the time. Um, absolutely not. Um, uh, also, I mean, I want to live. And so there's that aspect of my, of my freedom too. I will talk about one piece of this where, and I, and I mentioned this in the article too, um, there was a moment in it, maybe not one moment, many moments in, when I was going through chemotherapy, where I was in such a state of physical suffering, um, I, chemo did not go well for me, uh, that at one point my parents had come and stayed with us so that my husband could take care of my son and my parents were taking care of me. So I was in and out of the hospital and things. Um, and at one point I was in tears because the steroids had it so that I was so like jittery like this, but also then so tired. So I couldn't sit down, but I was so tired that it was hard to stay up. Um, and I just started crying and said, please don't make me do this again. Um, and I did it anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. And so despite the fact that my body was kind of working against me, um, I was able to say like my body was saying, don't do it, but I did it anyway. So there was some free, some freedom in that, depending on how you look at it, or maybe not so much. I don't know. Mm -hmm. No, thank you so much for sharing. I mean, so vulnerably and, you know, it's still fairly recent and I, I'm so glad that you're okay um, now and I'm glad I got you to meet you. Um, but yeah, freedom becomes more challenging. And I like, I, I want to put us in, in a really realistic context where like, if I was your therapist, I'm not sure I'd be like, well, um, let's talk about your freedom right now. But we need to understand the self-work is also work that is founded upon your basic needs being met. Talking to your client about <laughs> an evolved becoming of self or authenticity might not be the most relevant thing to do while they're actively suffering. So I think that that's a really good pause for us in terms of like, these things are great, but our client has to be in a space where they're actively working on themselves. And I also think finding freedom for you. I don't know. Did you feel any agency and like my body is really struggling? It doesn't necessarily want to do this, but I've chosen to do this. I, I don't know if like having the freedom to, and as you said, like, did you really have freedom to stop? I guess you did, but I wonder, was there any sort of like agency in the fact that you kind of pushed through? And that's a genuine question. I'm very curious. Yeah. yeah. Well, and this, there was a question and I, uh, back and I'm sorry, I can't think of it off the top of my head. There was something about dis like disconnection versus dissociation. And I will say that I was completely dissociated for six months. Like I was checked out. And so I don't know if I was aware that I was making these sort of choices of freedom. And if you, as my therapist would have come at me as far as like, you know, talking about, well, you do have a choice and there is freedom and, and that kind of thing, I'd be like, what you know like it just wouldn't have been oh, yeah. my head my head was um so I guess to that and where do you meet someone like where do you come in when someone is in that that sort of state of like I can't even engage with this right now for sure and such a good question because you engage with them where they need to be engaged. I mean, I feel like that's rule number one of therapy. You meet people where they are at. And I think this was an important conversation to be had in terms of like, this is identity self-development work that is a literally relevant in certain contexts or is paused in certain contexts or is hindered in certain contexts. Now, if your capacity to engage with your freedom persisted for a decade after your recovery, then maybe your therapist would be 
um, likely to bring it up and go like, hey, I so understand you didn't have these freedoms, but let's talk about the, do you feel like you have any freedoms now? Do you feel like you regained any freedoms with your recovery? So I don't think this should be pushed upon anyone. Timing context matters. And this context is very much like you're working on the identity piece. And usually that doesn't happen during a crisis or survival. So I love these questions and I love your honest answer. And I love the fact that although we find these concepts really interesting and helpful, they can be incredibly tone deaf if not used at appropriate times. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, maybe Frankel can talk about the fact that he had freedom of attitude I don't know if he would have talked about it during it, but reflecting after the fact, he did. And so I would have loved to pick his brain and be like, did you actually feel that way during or did you just realize that's kind of what you were doing? Or was that a task you set out for yourself? Um, there's a lot of, you know, unanswered questions there, but I, I, I love, thank you so much for sharing. And hopefully this gives some um details to such a, you know, um, a times blunt and abrasive concept. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I, I will say what I, while this would not have felt helpful, what from what I have learned from you, um, in the past couple of months is more in that place of like meaning making from existential therapy that, you know, from my, again, from my act brain thinking about values, something that would, would have been helpful, that was helpful was thinking, I am going to survive for my son. Like this just is not going to be a thing. Like Mm -hmm. I, and I, I mean, ultimately did I have control over that in, you know, with my specific situation? Yeah, I guess, but also sometimes you don't, but the, I understand that there's a fair bit of, um, of like the development of existential therapy around things like these major medical um, conditions, end of life experiences, um, palliative care and that kind of thing. Absolutely, I love that you brought that up and how much research has been conducted in those contexts. Um, I think, you know, when we talk about existential therapy, pick whatever therapy you're practicing it will not, a tool or an approach will not be appropriate for every context, right? Like it's just, you know, even if, you know, if you're in a, in a session and you want to practice immediacy, the here and now, the gestalt, it might not be appropriate for a certain context. So I think that's what we need to understand is that every single um, piece of information, every single tool, every single skill has to be used at the right time or else it can do more damage than good. And so in a situation like this, where um, there is a a medical diagnosis or a crisis, meaning making, I think would make a lot more sense than a conversation on freedom. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we can't assume that every single technique from every single modality would work in every single context. Um, So, yeah. Um. And do you want, are we, you want to stop here? Get I think back we're to good with freedom. Yeah. Just yeah. for time's sake, later we can go back to whatever questions were left unanswered. Let's talk about responsibility. Um, and responsibility is the other key component of the self. Um, this one, I'm just going to answer what I think it is, and then we'll get into the dialogue of choice, but responsibility. Um That's a tough one. And something that I say is that responsibility always matches our degree of freedom. So if you're not free to choose, you're not responsible for that choice, right? It makes sense. How could you possibly be responsible for a choice that you weren't free to make? And so these two um, contexts are so intertwined in terms of you're accountable for the choices that you make or don't make, because we do need to remember that inaction is also an action. It's also a choice. Um, and sorry, I'm just looking at my notes. So I'm jet lagged too. I just want to, I just want to preface guys. I am jet lagged. It is hitting me right now. Okay. Um, I think when we don't take responsibility for our choices, 
something's happened. And the thing that often happens is self-victimization. Thank you for the hearts. That's sweet. Um, self-victimization often comes from taking lack of responsibility. Again, sometimes we are victims, period. No discussion, no justification, no, no need to like justify why someone is a victim. We understand. However, oftentimes the lack of responsibility is what makes us a victim to life, to ourselves, to others, is because we're saying we we couldn't make that choice or that choice wasn't truly ours. We didn't have the freedom and maybe we did and we didn't take ownership of a choice. So even if you, you make a mistake and then you can go, I chose that mistake, that super sucked. I made a mistake, I need to learn from it and I need to keep going. That's taking accountability going um i made that mistake but in reality it was because joe said to show up at two and then janine said to show up at 2 15 and janine is usually right so and what you're doing there is you're saying i'm a victim to this mistake i didn't have anything to do with it and you do not take responsibility and if we take it into a clinical context so Yes, you're free to theoretically leave your marriage. Yes, you're free to theoretically stop therapy. But what you have to understand is that every choice and every freedom has a consequence. So you have to take responsibility for your action as well as your uh, consequence. And sometimes we'll encounter clients who will only take responsibility for their action, but not their consequence. Um, and that's sometimes fascinating, or they won't take responsibility for any of it. Um, but they'll be like, well, I decided I no longer wanted to be married. Okay, sure. You have every, you had the freedom to decide you didn't want to be married. But then it was really hard for them to take responsibility of the fallout of the fact that their you know, partner doesn't want to talk to them. Their kids are really upset. They're financially um strained and then it becomes like i'm a victim to all these things happening to me when in reality you have to take responsibility for the choice as well as the consequences of that choice um and i think that's particularly important when we talk about the self because you need to take accountability for every single thing you do and the way that it impacts your self-development um so in therapy, I really like to ask clients, especially if they're really heated and there's a narrative going on and there's they're reading me text exchanges or um, they're recounting an argument. I like to ask, what are you responsible for in this context? And what are you not responsible for in this context? I think, again, being really careful, you're not trying to impose responsibility on them that is not theirs, because that's not fair and that's not helpful, that's not authentic. But asking them to discern, to figure out, okay, I'm responsible sometimes just for this much, sometimes for this much of the whole context. And so introducing responsibility in, in our therapeutic sessions can be so helpful because they will start to be able to self-evaluate and to gain a bit of self-distancing and to have a bit of perspective. Of course, they feel strong emotions, but I think the point is to, to get them to understand what has, what about their actions and their, their showing up in the world has led to some of those emotions. And honestly, sometimes the answer is nothing, but Sometimes it is something, and I think it can be really helpful because that is like a massive magnifying glass of like their existence is like, this is how you're showing up in the world. Now you have to take responsibility for the fact that you showed up this way in the world um, and maybe learn from it and maybe pivot. So I think that's just a fun question to ask our clients of like, hey, in this whole scenario, what do you think you can take responsibility for? And like, hey, what responsibility might you be taking that's not yours? And what should you leave for others? Um, any questions, thoughts on responsibility before we head into choices? Um, we'll just give those a minute to kind of flow in and I'll go ahead and ask. I will say when I, when I first was learning about responsibility, I did worry like that sort of thought of like sometimes when when I tell when I, I think that like someone has a responsibility to do something it feels like a judgment or it feels like um 
you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing or you're not taking ownership. Does that ever, does that ever come up or is that <laughs> I'm just completely misrepresenting responsibility? No, you're right. It's like, who are you to tell someone what they're responsible to do? But, you know, you can see an argument unfold and be like, you know, you're probably responsible for the fact you brought up their ex-girlfriend during, you know, like family dinner. It's like, and that's where that conversation happened. But I think that's never the point. I, I think something that I at least abide by is never to um, force the truth that I perceive on someone, because that's not the point. You have to deal with their truth. And so that's why I like the reframing of like, hey, think really hard is there anything you could be responsible for? Because I do want to honor them. I don't want to shame them. And ultimately, I have no idea if they should be taking responsibility or if that's just what I think they should be taking responsibility for, which is not helpful. And it's an imposition on their sense of self, right? Because we're dealing with the self. And so I do not want to impose on your sense of self. And so I think whenever I have those conversations with clients, it is never me pointing out what I think they should take responsibility for. It's like, here's a metaphor of someone taking responsibility or what do you think was your role in this is another way to reframe that question. And then it's, it's, you know, a dialogue they can have with themselves. But I, again, I don't think that you would ever, you know, impose that on them. That being said, ignoring what responsibility your client has for the way they live their life is also not doing them justice, which goes back to the beginning of this lecture of like lecture uh, workshop of like um, speaking the truth and being a mirror to things that they don't want to hear. And sometimes we need to let them know that the only person responsible for how they show up is them and there's no one else that can do it for them. So it is a really fine, delicate line, but I would never go into specifics of what that looks like for an individual. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and this, this is a comment, but I think this fits well here. Um, Kim said, I can think of clients and people in my life who would be angry at even the suggestion that they were responsible for any part of their struggle, which keeps them stuck. And that does, that does feel relevant because is not our role as therapists also to be helping our clients get unstuck. Of course. Me too, Kim. Me too. Uh, <laughs> I definitely have family, friends, and clients who feel that way. Um, yeah. So again, it's, it's about starting a general conversation of responsibility. And I think it's having a really safe space. So, you know, I have clients who present in their dialogues with others, very defensive, but they take very good feedback. Like they, they're so receptive to feedback when it comes to me. And I'm very grateful. And I think a part of that is building that rapport of like, there is no shame. There is no judgment. The only reason I want you to consider responsibility is so that you can live a better life so that you can get whatever you want. And so you can be your authentic self. So you can be happy. These are things people want. And I think a bit of that is like framing it. It's not about blame. It's about empowerment. If you understand what you did or didn't do or what your role was, it means you can change it. So I think a lot of it is like how you present it to your mother, or to your client of like, and then there's clients that respond quite well to tough love. And I don't rule that out of like, hey, do you want to hear? Sometimes I'll say, do you want to hear how I experienced that story? And then you, and if they're open to that, you can be like, Hey, I, you know, is there, is it possible that you are responsible for this part of it? So again, super fine line, but I think again, as long, I mean, as long as you're phrasing it as I want you to live the life that you want and responsibility is part of that, rather than I'm shaming you or blaming you. Um, I think it's very helpful. Um, and then the, a question, is it responsibility for what happened i.e. their present circumstances or responsibility for getting out of the place they're in? Ooh, good question. All of the above. I think, you know, it's, it's how you show up in the world, how you showed up in the world that led to the moment of how you're showing up currently. 
Um, I don't think we ever stop being responsible. Again, as long as you're free, you're responsible. And that's probably one of the least sexy, one of the least comforting components of all of this. But I, I do think it's important to understand that like you cannot escape responsibility. You can pretend not to be responsible and it's still there. And all it's going to hurt is your sense of self and those around you. And so, you know, um, you are responsible for how you deal with, you know, the mess you may have created in the past, or unfortunately, sometimes you're responsible for the mess other people made. That is the hardest one. I think when we are hurt by somebody and they make a huge mess and then we have to clean it up, that is so incredibly unfair. But the reason I'm telling you to clean up your mess is not for them. It's so that you're not sitting in the messy space for the rest of your life because you deserve better so again it's like it's coming from such a place of like i care about you and i think you deserve to live without the mess and i used an example of a guy called chad who um had his parents you know either get divorced while he was in high school or his first love cheat on him and so now chad is in his 30s and he is mistreating every partner that he's with. A lot of people go into therapy being like, yeah, Chad really needs some help so he can stop hurting Casey, who he's dating. And for me, I go, oh, Casey's not my concern. Also, Casey's making her own choices and going to take her own responsibility for dating Chad. What I want for Chad, though, is for him to feel like he can show up in a fruitful way because chances are chad wants love and he wants connection and he's just too scared to do it and he's too um he's not willing to take the responsibility of the role he's playing and which is running his every relationship and so now chad is like why can't i have the things that i want and i think i deserve and so for me the responsibility piece is like chad deserves better this is why chad should take responsibility it's really not about the people he's hurting or not hurting it's the fact that he's hurting himself and he's not showing up authentically and he's not being his true self and i think that that's like a heavy way to live your life so that's responsibility. Um, yeah. Let's talk about choice, if that's cool with everybody. So choices, big or small, choices shape who we become. Um, I remember posting on Instagram something like every decision, big or small, will ultimately shape the person you become. And the amount of comments that I got, like, that's so intense. Like, I cannot possibly think of every single decision I'm making. Um, and that's like too much of a hassle, too much of a responsibility. I get it. A hundred percent it is. And I think all we can do is try our best. But I think understanding that choices are the building blocks of yourself. And it is that self-expression and that without expressing who you are, the self doesn't exist choices become increasingly more significant and so you know did you drink did you not drink did you sleep very much did you have that conversation did you not have that conversation all of these things are starting to represent your sense of self and either bring you closer to who you want to be or further away and as i've said like there's no escaping choice you're always choosing something in your passivity or in your actions. Um, and something to ask our clients is what choices do they have? So if they're feeling really overwhelmed by something, I sometimes like to ask, like, what choice are you trying to make? What are all the choices that you have? Um, and what choices do you feel like have been taken away from you? And that's connecting it to the freedom piece. So choices are building blocks of our authentic self which is our next topic, authenticity, inauthenticity, which I'm super excited about. This term is so overused and misused and everywhere on social right now. And I just think there is, let's just come back to what authenticity is. Um, a lot of people use authenticity as a scapegoat. They will do something that upsets someone and then they'll go, well, I'm just being authentic. And then how do you argue with that? <laughs> and does being authentic excuse poor behavior? Does being authentic, is that a thing when you're um, not 
owning your decisions. Is that, is that possible? Is that being authentic? And so I love the topic of authenticity. So Sartre said, authenticity meant to accept the full weight of our freedom. We get it. He's really into the, the freedom component. And so I, in my practice, will often have clients who will say things like, um, I'm trying to make a decision. What is the right decision? Do I support this person? Do I lend them money? Do I take them back? Um, what is the right thing to do? And this is where Satra's words really echo. And it's not about the one right thing. I think as humans, we really want to like nail the precision. It's like, what is the one right thing? And it's more just about... Um, not a universal answer. I always say, if you do this, will it feel aligned? Will you feel like you are showing up in a way that truly represents who you are? And that prompt generally gets them to figure out which thing that they do. It's like, which of these will reflect you the most accurately? Which choice reflects the way that you see yourself? Um, and I think that that's a really cool part about authenticity. So in the framework of existential analysis, authenticity is often talked about as like finding space and a center within ourselves, which I think is so grounding, is so beautiful. Um, and it says authenticity is a space where our doubting ends and we feel grounded, like we have hit the depth within. I think that's such a beautiful explanation of what it feels like to feel authentic. It's like that good heaviness, that like embodiment, that resonance, that sense of home. Um, and I really like it because, again, it's about saying this is me in this particular moment and this is how I'm choosing to be in this particular moment. This is not me forever. This is not an accidental me. But authenticity is saying, this is me in this moment. This is how I want to be. And I really, really like that reframe. Um, and let's just talk about the history of it really briefly, which is that the concept of authenticity comes to us mainly from Heidegger's 1927 um, book, Being in Time. Uh, so he coined a ver word in German that I'm not going to try to pronounce. and But it literally means ownness or being owned or being one's own. And that although we are free and responsible, authenticity could be understood as owning what we do and who we are at every unique intersection of existence from moment to moment. And I think that that's really beautiful because really authenticity, the other word for authenticity or the summary of authenticity is just owning oneself. And I think that feels very different than a lot of things that we see written about authenticity. It's like really taking ownership and accountability for who you are. Um, there is a dialogue that Sartre talks about. I think it was Sartre and he goes like, yeah, I could have acted otherwise it's not that I couldn't have made another decision but that would have changed the entire makeup of who I am and I just love that I think that is so beautiful it's like yeah I could have acted a different way but that would have changed the essence of who I am and I think when we understand it um at that level it really um changes what it means to live in an aligned and authentic way um I think this is also a really fun way to teach clients about authenticity, um, especially when it comes to trauma, especially when it comes to anxiety, when it comes to depression. Um, we sometimes feel so labeled by these experiences or so overtaken by these experiences that I had a really hard time going I'm struggling with anxiety. I am not anxiety or I am not just an anxious person in my early 20s. And what did it mean to be authentic while I was suffering from something like that? What did it mean to, to show up authentically or own my actions during it when I felt like so much of it was out of my control? And I think the moments where I felt most embodied and most um authentic was when I went like 
I'm going to do this because it aligns with the way that I see myself, which is not necessarily as an anxious person and like trying to grasp little moments like that, um, where I can exercise my authenticity. So obviously we're going to talk about what inauthenticity is, but I'm wondering, do we have questions about authenticity, um, or comments about authenticity? Um, as we wait for those to come in, there were two questions that came in about um, the pros and cons you mentioned. Pros and cons. Pros mentioned. and cons of each decision. Okay. Is it ringing a bell? No. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, uh, so for those of you who are asking about pros and cons, please go ahead. Oh, it's the same person. Um, please provide more information to us uh, about that so we can answer. Um, in the meantime, uh, do you think that remaining true to yourself could lead to you being taken advantage of? Ooh. I don't, I, I would really like to know a context for this, mm. but no, is my instinct. Um, I think it kind of becomes irrelevant, irrelevant what other people gain or miss out when you're authentic, because that is not the primary relationship you're trying to cultivate or preserve. So I think that, you know, if some people really benefit from you being authentic, are you talking about like, I'm really authentically empathetic. So when I show up for everyone, people take advantage of me um is that kind of the situation i was at a philosophy seminar last weekend in new york it was their annual conference of modern philosophy and someone asked it was on friendship and love and someone asked like my friend cares less about me than i care about my friend should i care less in order to make that relationship work and my answer which is very different than the purely philosophical one is that what you should do is cultivate a relationship you're proud of and that represents who you are and the way that that's received is not on you um and if the other person just gets a benefit of having a really kick-ass friend and you feel really aligned with that decision fantastic i think if we are stopping to be a good friend to someone because we feel like we you know, give them more than they give us, although we're so okay with giving that much, then they're actually, we're encroaching on our sense of self, we're editing ourselves, and we're, be, we're not using our freedom, we're not being super aligned with our choice. And I think that's actually an inauthentic action. Hmm. So that and, and Sarah did, re, um, uh, not you, Sarah, other Sarah, uh, did provide context, and you were right on hey, so kindness was the question. Kindness. Yeah, about yeah, you know, kindness is not even always about others. I think we should be kind to others, but if kindness is what you self identify as, not being kind is allowing other people to um, prevent you from being yourself, and that is just not worth it. So, for me, I'm like, if you get an extra something because I'm being true to myself, win win. <laughs> That's right. Although um, I do think you should be careful with like one um, one directional relationships because we deserve to also receive. So make sure that who you're surrounding yourself with is also, you know, um, nurturing that relationship and making sure your needs are met. But in general, my attitude is let, let people do their thing and receive you however they want. As long as you're being authentic, I think that's a win. Thank you. Um, a little bit of a case example. I have a, a brilliant client who gets very anxious when her headaches are debilitating and prevent her from attending classes at the university, which then sends her into a spiral that she is not going to do as well as she wants and blames herself as she has bought into others narratives that her worrying and the pressure she places on herself causes the headaches. Mm -hmm. How do I encourage her authenticity? Ooh, so she has headaches because she's uh, she has headaches. She misses classes that makes her anxious. And then others are saying it's your fault that, that you have these headaches because you're anxious. Is that am I getting that correct? 
Um, let me read that part, which then sends her into a spiral that she is not going to do. She's not going to do as well as she wants. And then she blames herself mm. as, yes, she has bought into others' narratives that her worrying is causing the headaches. Yeah. So it's like others say that and she now buys it. If we look at authentic as ownership, then we go she owns that she has headaches and she owns the fact that she does the best she can with what has been given to her and i think there doesn't have to be any blame there can just be acceptance and ownership of realities that exist so she has headaches is she causing them maybe is that her fault? I I mean, I would never be like, take responsibility for the fact that you're, I'd be like, are you stretching? Are you hydrating? Are you moving your body? How's your body feeling? Like you can have those types of conversations, but I think what is authentic is that she's trying her best. And even if she's a perfectionist, even if she cares about school, I would really go like, hey, you're someone that really goes for what she wants and really cares about academics and really, and like, that is the authenticity that is the ownership despite all the obstacles the obstacles are not the authentic part what's authentic is like her desire her drive and the fact that she still shows up even you know after a headache and after she's missed you know maybe a couple classes and she still takes that exam to me that's authenticity awesome cool okay so inauthentic so being inauthentic is the unobstruct no sorry being authentic is the unobstructed ability to be one's true self in daily life being inauthentic would be the opposite um if you think about authenticity and inauthenticity i think about moving really fast in forward moving really fast forward um in a forward motion and you either go a bit to the left or a bit to the right you cannot go left and right at the same time so meaning every action is going to be either a bit more authentic or a bit less authentic. And this is why it's so important to make uh, conscious decisions because there's no neutral path. And I think sometimes we're like, I just want that neutral sweet spot where what I just did did not impact my authenticity or inauthenticity. And I don't think that that necessarily exists. And that's because of the way that we define inauthenticity. So being inauthentic is when decisions and actions we undertake are not really our own and do not genuinely express who we understand ourselves to be. So if you understand yourself to be a certain type of person and you do not act in this accordance, that is inauthentic. To be inauthentic, according to Heidegger, is to not be an author of our own life. It's to become unowned or disowned. And I think that that's a really beautiful way of saying it. You are an author of your life. Um, and when you drop the pen or when you disown yourself, that's when inauthenticity kind of kicks in. So now that we know what being authentic or inauthentic means, I think when a client comes in and they're trying to construct a sense of self, they're trying to do what's right, I think the question can be reframed to what is authentic, what do you want to take ownership of, and what action is going to lead you closer to being the person you want and the life that you want. So self-loss. Let's talk about that a little bit here. Um, self-loss is the opposite of having yourself. <laughs> um, this is, I think, one of the most common human sufferings that um, occurs that are left unaddressed. Um, I think not knowing who you are, I think waking up one day and going, who am I? Like, why am I here? I just did this thing and I don't even recognize myself in this Um action can be so disorienting so painful so isolating and i think it's really important to address self-loss as a concept in a therapeutic context so what happens if the person we're trying to look at in therapy um, is not there so what if you're like sarah i'm trying to look at the who in the therapy the self in the therapy but they're not there that makes our job significantly more difficult. And I think that's when we have to pivot more into the self loss work and, and helping the client to reconstruct that self rather than just fine tune it. So self loss um, is, I have two definitions for it. Um, one is self loss is our failed responsibility to be ourself. 
it's a harsher sort of a definition, but what it's saying is the only way to be yourself is to take responsibility for your life. So if you're not being yourself, you have failed at that responsibility. So it's really talking about the mechanism of self. But in reality, you know, self loss is being estranged from or lacking congruence, resonance, and alliance with who we truly are. It's the feeling of being inconsistent and inauthentic, of having our actions, feelings, and decisions cease to represent how we understand and experience ourselves as truly being. So you might be asking for, you know, you might be asking me, Sarah, how is inauthenticity and self loss any different? Because they kind of sound the same. And the metaphor that I like to use is imagine that inauthenticity is diving in the ocean and you're deep but you're very aware of where the surface is you're also very aware of what like I will take my next breath up there and I know how to get there and I have enough time to get there so that's you know being an authentic is saying yes you're going to do something when you don't want to do it perhaps that's your being an authentic self-loss is like being underwater caught in a current it's dark and you understand that you need to start swimming, but you have no idea where the surface is, when you'll be able to take your next breath and you think you might die. And I think that's the, the difference. And sometimes self-loss is caused by um, constant inauthenticity um, and repeated inauthenticity. But I think this metaphor shows you how viscerally different it is and how much the threat um, is amplified in self-loss. Um, and there are so many reasons as to, and we're going to talk about that, why someone might feel self-loss and why they might feel um, disconnected, um, such as depression and anxiety being a huge one, trauma in particular. I mean, we, we talk about disconnection, we talk about dissociation, we talk about so many things related to trauma. I think it's important to realize like the self can also be lost as a consequence of experiencing trauma. And as the moral injury sort of um, example presented, sometimes it's not enough just to treat the trauma symptoms, but to look and rebuild the sense of self simultaneously. Um, so personal experience, we all like to talk about our personal experiences, especially when they inform uh, the way that we work. And so I'm just going to, I think a lot of people are like, how does self-loss look? So I'm just going to share really briefly what that looked like for me. I was 24 years old. Um, I was doing life right, or so they told me. You know, I was in grad school and I had a great community. I was in a relationship. I, I seem to be ticking off the boxes. And I was absolutely miserable, but in so much um, denial that I truly, like, I, I would cry and then I would still be like, but I have a great life. Like there was such a disconnect. And I think part of it is because I felt so guilty. So the girl in the bomb shelters would be so blown away by the fact that I was living this life. So who was I, one of the lucky ones to immigrate to Canada, to get a good education, to be in a relationship? Like who was I to complain about my seemingly perfect life? And so that totally prevented me from foreseeing it for what it was. And what it was, was me living in self-preservation, checking off every box just to make sure that I would be safe, that I would be loved, that I would belong, that I wouldn't get any criticism. So I'm 24 years old. I go on a vacation with my sister. And I meet a friend and he asks me, are you happy? And this is kind of how my book begins. And for some reason or another, it's the first time that I realize that I'm not and that I'm simply enduring life. And I kind of talk about the scene where I go into the bathroom at the bar because I'm uncontrollably crying and I'm wiping my face and I'm looking in a mirror and I go, who is she? Like such disconnect where it's like okay I'm moving my hand so I know it's me but she seems hollow she seems lifeless she is such a stranger and I think self-loss I really like it's a stranger within 
And it was so devastating. And I had so much disdain and hate for her. Um, and just looking at her and being physically confronted with the fact that the person I was looking at is not someone I recognized and is not someone I liked. And that was the moment I think that actually triggered my anxiety and my panic attacks because the next morning was the first time ever that I had a panic attack. It was on a flight. It was very severe. I had paramedics come. I had to deplane. I went to into a paralysis. Um, and it was very fascinating that it came, you know, hours after this realization that I truly didn't know who I was. And I think that that is not an uncommon experience. And I think that sometimes we go, oh, you're just going through a crisis. And we like to downplay an experience like that. When in reality, for a lot of people, that is existentially threatening. Um, and I don't know, you know, what you compare having a stranger live within you how you compare that to any other sort of suffering. And I'm not saying like, it's the worst suffering. Absolutely. Like, no, I'm not making those claims at all. I just mean, it's really, really unique. And I think it's been dismissed for quite a long time. Um, so I studied it for a really long time. Um, as one does in psychology, I studied moral injury and the theme of self-loss kept Reemerging, I studied moral injury in domestic violence. I studied moral injury in infidelity. And the theme, the painful point of all these experiences were the loss of self. And what hurt the most, for the most part, was their participation in this loss, which we're going to get to later. So what causes self-loss? There are three major things that cause self-loss. One of them is certain events that modify the relationship we have with ourself because they present a barrier or a hurdle to understanding or embodying who we are. Um, and once we have these painful experiences, um, and a lot of them are traumatic, the following happen. One, we begin to self-identify with the pain or the event. So all we become is this event which obviously encroaches on our sense of self or for example if you cheated or been divorced or dropped out of school now you're a cheater a divorcee and a dropout and that becomes kind of the the identity so sometimes when we live through life altering events we allow that event to hijack our entire identity uh, the second thing that can happen is that we struggle to reconcile who we were prior to the event and who we are now so I see this a lot in uh, people becoming parents. So who you were before having a child and now who you're expressing to be while you have a child, it's really hard to sometimes connect them. And because we don't know how to connect them, we feel very fragmented and the self-loss can start to kind of cultivate. And then the third thing that can happen with life altering events is we experience mental health struggles that make us feel less connected to, oh, yeah, uh, less connected to or ashamed of ourselves. So um, let's say that you lived through something traumatic, and as a consequence, you really struggle with depression or anxiety. Now, that's really difficult because with depression, we, most people feel quite disconnected from themselves. With anxiety, a lot of people want to avoid themselves because they are so overstimulated and so overwhelmed um, that whatever manifestation comes up, as and what I mean by that is like whatever symptoms that emerge as a consequence of this event can sometimes make it really difficult for us to want to get close to ourselves. And for me, that was definitely true with anxiety. So I just want to see if there are any questions because I just flew through that. Uh, <laughs> let's see if there's anything before we talk about modeled behavior and family rules. Um, so uh we're not there we go um i do i don't want to miss this pros and cons thing since it came up before so let me go back to that for just one second if that's okay um so uh and i apologize if i'm saying your name wrong nicia i believe uh said pros and cons with each decision we must consider the pros and cons of each possible decision then we choose what fits our values 
what will be the potential impact on others and what will be the results for us, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think you can take other people out of the equation because if you hurt someone, that might not feel very authentic to you. So I think it is right to be like, who do I want to become? Who do I think I am? How does it, you know, protect me, serve me? But then it's also how am I treating other people? How am I existing in the world? Because although it's about them, it's truly a reflection of you. So I do think that there's a lot of calculations in mathematics in terms of like making decisions. It's why they become so serious. But I think the the stronger your sense of self becomes, the faster these decisions um, are made. And once, you know, you'll automatically know like, no, that was right for me. No, that was wrong for me. And you won't have to agonize about it as you might during the development of your sense of self, because you will just know that that really doesn't align because you are so sad and so aware of your current values and beliefs um, and the way that you want to express yourself. Um. This is something I would have to look up. You might know. It, Erica is wondering, is this similar to the idea of soul loss? Soul loss? I don't, I think I've heard of the phrase, but I, I'm so not well versed in that, that I shouldn't speak to it. Um, there's a lot of religious based literature on similar ideas, philosophy based literature. So I wouldn't be surprised if there was another way of speaking about it. This is just more of an existential spin, but again, nothing new under the sun. So I'd be really surprised if something like this didn't exist in a different theory. Uh, would you say self-loss and shame are interconnected? Oh, yes, I would. Um, and only because of my extensive research for moral injury, I think people who experienced a lot of shame, which we know is very different than guilt. It's not, I made a mistake, but I am a mistake. I think individuals who just hold so much shame have a really hard time um, accepting themselves or feeling that they're worthy of that um, choice and freedom that they might have, or they might take on way more responsibility than they should. And so I think shame can be a really big stumbling blocks for people to move on and be active. Cause again, to build your sense of self, you have to be active and shame generally deactivates us and it makes us go into hiding. And then when we become passive about our existence, I think it can be easier to get lost. Thank you. Um, so as you uh, have mentioned moral injury, I just want to let everybody know I am dropping in the chat, not in the Q&A, but in the chat, a recent article uh, from our psychotherapy magazine uh, that was written by Jack Saul um, on moral injury. If you want to learn more about that, I just figured I would share that awesome resource because it's a beautiful article. Yeah. And I think him and Esther Perel have like annual moral injury meetings, conferences. So I think it's, it's really cool. Um, yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, um, when I talk about um, modeled behavior or family rules, I think this is um, a tricky one. So if a client had a, a caretaker who showed uh, inauthenticity is the only way of existing. They might not know what authenticity is. Um, I also think some clients um, are born into context in which they were told who to be, or even just on social media and they're told who to be, and they're not allowed to question it, or they do question it, or, or you know, um, take a different path. They're rejected, which makes us not very incentivized to be authentic. And so I think what's important here is to get our clients to evaluate why they hold the beliefs that they do. So um, I had a client who grew up in a purity culture, followed rules without understanding any potential repercussions on the self-body um, relationship, didn't really like she thought she was very sensual and sexual, but was like, this is just completely wrong. And um felt like that denial of her body eventually led to self-loss. And again, there's nothing, it's okay to choose whatever culture you want, like purity culture. It's okay to believe anything you want to believe. But I think this the step that we miss sometimes that leads to self-loss is the 
lack of discernment, the lack of assessment. So you can go, I was born with these, you know, values and beliefs and um, rules and expectations. And I will discern if I want to abide by them. And you might look at them and be like, you know what? That actually really resonates with me. So I'm going to do it. And I think it's not about being anti-institution or, you know, being completely independent of culture, which I don't think is possible, but it's about figuring out what actually fits for you and then doing that particular thing. And even if you're if your actions don't change at all, knowing that you chose those actions feels very different. Instead of like, I was born into this, so I just do it, being like, yes, I was born into this but I have assessed it and this really aligns. So now I will do it. And sometimes we get so lost in, in the, in the rules and regulations, especially around families where we can't express ourselves. We're not allowed to question them. And because we're not allowed to question them, we can't take ownership of them. And so I think that's one of uh, huge causes of self-loss that I'm seeing. And the last cause of self-loss that I'm going to be talking about is self-betrayal. Um, self-betrayal, you know, is not a clinical diagnosis, but the term is often used within the mental health and self-help community to describe when one denies parts of oneself. So your needs or your thoughts or your feelings. And I think that description alone kind of shows us why it will lead to, um, self-loss. I think when you abandon yourself frequently enough, when you shift your loyalty from who you are, um, and from you into other people, into someone else, this is where we become less intentional, less aligned. And it's kind of like taking a step back from the speaker. And every time you do something that doesn't align, you take another step back. And eventually you're not going to hear the sound. You're not going to hear the music. You're not going to hear the alignment. And if we want to take it back to that metaphor of the water, you're not going to know where the surface is. And so it's more of a gradual, passive, well-intended way to lose yourself. I think it's probably one of the most common ways we lose ourselves. Um, but I think um, the consequences are just the same. And it's really crappy when you're like, I tried so hard. I tried so hard for everyone else. And the consequence was that I no longer feel connected and that I'm so fragmented because I have tried to be something for everyone else that I kind of tore myself into pieces and handed it out. And now I don't have a full picture of who I am anymore. Any questions on the three major causes? Uh, so, uh, yes. Sorry, I was letting my dog in my office and then my dog changed their mind. No. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Okay. How does one strength? Uh, how does one strengthen sense of self while trying to make a a major life change? Ooh, yeah, great question. I also think that's a um a huge life change is also an incredible uh, opportunity to lose yourself. <laughs> so I, I think understanding it of like a life change is a way to show up for myself in a really major way. Um can be really reaffirming and understanding that whatever decision you're making during this huge transition is not easy, I think almost solidifies us more. It's like, wow, I was willing to go to these lengths to do this. And I think when clients are undergoing a transition, pointing out that opportunity to show up for themselves, to stand up for themselves, to take care of themselves and getting them to observe it. You know, I'll go and tell my client like, wow, the way you, you talk to this person, wow, the way that you set that boundary, even though you were going through all of this, it's such a great way to build inner safety and for them to go, wow, I really did it. Like I, I am the person I thought I, I could be and that, you know, that I want to be. And so I think as long as we look at it as an opportunity and frame it as an opportunity rather than a risk, I think that can be a really interesting conversation um, with clients and also within ourselves. Um, okay. Then uh, Heather has a question um, what are your thoughts about changing the person's narrative 
to have agency and redemption a la Jonathan Adler's psychologist research. Sorry, you cut out. Can you repeat that again? Sorry, that's my internet. Um, no. What are your thoughts about changing the person's narrative to have agency and redemption a la Jonathan Adler? I still couldn't hear you. Oh my God. I'm oh, so sorry. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. He um, beats us. <laughs> Is that a me... sign that we keep going? Let's keep Let's going. We'll try again. Let me fix my internet. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Um, so let's talk about trauma, anxiety, depression, mostly because I feel like those are three common things we deal with in therapy. Um, so we self lost the chicken or the egg really good question. If you're a therapist, you probably encountered trauma, anxiety, and depression, or all three at once. Um, when dealing with the problem, um, how did you understand the problem? How did you approach it? And what tools did you use? And I think this is just my way of asking, did you consider the self-loss was involved? And sometimes it's really difficult to understand if they were feeling so lost that they may have developed anxiety or depression as a consequence or did they experience depression or trauma and because of the symptoms because of the disconnect because of the overwhelm they are now struggling with self-loss and it's really difficult to discern what would have come first i think every um context is a little different but i just wanted to post this and put it out there that next time you're maybe dealing with these three really serious issues and really common presenting um, issues in, in a therapeutic setting, you can ask yourself, like, is there any way the self-loss is a component of this? And as we're dealing with symptoms, is there a way to strengthen that sense of self that might offset some of the suffering that's happening? Um, what I want to talk about is that... <laughs> It's so hard to be authentic and to have yourself in today's society. And I think that's something we need to acknowledge for our clients as well. But we also can't just ignore society. We can't go like, um, I'm just going to do whatever I'm going to do. And I'm going to isolate myself and figure it out. And it just doesn't work that way because you have to exist in a society and we're social beings. And so how we look at it is that we see the self in existential analysis in terms of two poles or mirrors, so inside and outside, which are important for our view of the self. So the inside pole reflects to us how we experience ourselves um, and evaluate how accurately, you know, the outside reflections agree with our own evaluation. So what's happening is we go, okay, this is how I'm seeing myself. And then you get an evaluation from someone else. And sometimes it is not the same evaluation. And this can be so disorienting for a client. And this can be disorienting when they're in a session with you because they might be experiencing something a certain way. And then you'll reflect back to them something that doesn't resonate. And I think that this is such a great opportunity um, to to work that out with a client in a productive way so let's say that uh, your client thinks they're a great communicator but everyone around them is complaining that they're really vague or unclear or withdrawn um what do you do if everyone is reflecting back to them that they're a poor communicator and they understand that they're a good communicator the mirrors are not matching up and they don't actually know what to do in that moment. Or I like to use an analogy of you go to a really fancy dinner party and you're really feeling yourself and you look really great and you show up and there's people around you and they're staring at you, taking pictures, they're laughing, and you're not really sure why. So you run to the mirror and you look at yourself. You're like, did I rip something? Did I spill something? You're like, nope, still look great. And you see a woman washing her hands and she's like looking at you and giving you the, the stink eye. And so you get the courage to ask her what is happening? Like, why are you looking at me this way? Why are people looking at me this way? And she goes, well, you're wearing a clown suit to a dinner party. You look in a mirror, you're still wearing your dress. She's telling you you're wearing a clown suit. And so this is what happens 
when um, society doesn't reflect accurately who we think we are. And it's so painful and it's so disorienting. And there is no cure for that. I think what's important to realize in those moments is that we need to find people who are genuinely interested in reflecting back to us accurately. Because sometimes we're going to see and look in a mirror and see things we don't want to see, but sometimes that's for our benefit. That means we can then go and change those things. But sometimes those mirrors are not representing something that's accurate and it's not, you know, something that we need to change. And so the only way to kind of protect this formulation of sense of self and protect ourselves from being lost is to be around people who genuinely want to see us, who are open and vulnerable enough to reflect back what they're seeing. And that is, as a therapist, what our position is. It's to be as accurate of a mirror as possible, regardless if they like or don't like what they're seeing. But I think it's a really tough role. And if they are feeling so dysregulated all the time, asking them to reflect on who their mirrors are can be a really, really powerful way for them to feel more congruent, more seen, more understood, not just by others, but also by themselves. So self loss let's talk a little bit about the role your client might be playing um, in self-loss. Self-loss, you can be a victim, an agent, or both. So a victim is someone who experiences self-loss as a consequence of events occurring outside of their control. So for example, trauma that can disrupt their sense of self. Um, great. That's, I think, very clear. Then we have an agent. An agent is someone whose decisions have led to the experience of self-loss. So maybe that would be someone who uh, betrays themselves. So the gradual self-betrayal, putting other people first, not checking in with themselves, ignoring their body, all of these eventually started to lead to self-loss. And so they became an agent. What I believe for a lot of people is that magical mix of something happened, an event happened that triggered it. And then we ended up perpetuating the loss by the way we chose to show up after the event happened. And so I think this is just an interesting thing to keep in mind um, when you're dealing with um, self-loss in a session of like, can the client identify the role that they're playing? Um, can you help them see their role and how can they choose um, to tap out of the game essentially? Um, common cause consequences of self-loss. So I think this could be really helpful. Um, before, you know, we wrap it up with some um, tips on how to deal with it is like, what are you actually looking for? Like I had a nice, compelling personal story. You get it philosophically, but what are we actually looking for? So um, we're looking for emotional disconnect, difficulty self-regulating, strained self-body relationship, unhealthy relationship patterns with others, lack of boundaries, lack of meaning, lack of inner consent, burnout, anxious thoughts, low mood. And you might think to yourself, okay, that also sounds like a lot of other things. And this is why, although we need to know what the consequences are, we need to be aware of what it actually is and how it functions to usually accurately uh, identify it. And um, one way that I identified a client, it's really difficult to figure out what was happening, but she was you know, always in a crisis. She would send me long emails uh, anytime there was a disagreement or she had to make a decision or there was a deadline at work. There was perpetual, like a uh, perpetual crisis and she would never want to be alone. So always listening to music, Netflix in the background, calling her friends, never even driving alone in silence or going to a store in silence, like taking a walk in silence. So perpetually just avoiding being alone and being scared to be alone. And I think, you know, the things I noticed was difficulty self-regulating. So she was always emailing me or talking to someone else. 
And this avoidance and fear of looking inside and sitting with herself, it was very fascinating to see how overwhelming it felt to try to um, see what she had to say. She always wanted someone else to give her the opinion, to tell her what to do. And so this was just one case of, of self-loss that kind of took me a second to crack because you're like, what is happening here? Why is there so much this regulation? Why, you know, and then this client, um, I had another client who would constantly be um, choosing partners that they needed to save. Again, we can look at this in so many ways as uh, attachment theory has a lot to say on it. But it was interesting because helping them figure out who they were, I think, was easier than um, figuring out who the client was. And so they really loved helping others you know, figure out who they were. Um, and part of that, I think, was just craving to figure out, who, you know, um, who they were. That was very confusing. But they wanted their partner to figure out who they were so that they can figure out who they were. And so it just manifests in so many ways. And it's why I think all the theory of like what it is is so important because the manifestation is abundant and often co-occurring with other mental health struggles. So therapy. <laughs> The relationship between two selves, I really like that as the definition of therapy. I think there's something about um, existential therapy in particular that's unique, and that's that we're not technique driven. Um, it is very relationship driven. Um, we don't go in knowing exactly what we're going to talk about and what checklist we're going to go through or what, um, you know, skills they're going to try in, during that session. It's very much making yourself very vulnerable to whatever the client is presenting because we realize that the client, whoever they come in, every time they come in, they're a slightly different version. So having a fully constructed plan of how you're going to show up in session can um, make you miss the client. And so I think there's something really beautiful about that. It makes it a lot tricky. I think modalities are more driven by, uh, by particular tools and, and exercises. Sometimes it's easier to measure rigor um, and make sure that you're doing the right thing. Um, but I think with this, it's just really such a personal experience and I think when we're sitting, we've been talking a lot about how to identify the self of the client. And something I really want to encourage you to do is try to identify yourself. So you are there as much as they are. I understand your role is very different than the role of the client, but yourself is fully, fully present. And I think that is just so important. Um you here's what I think. I'm, I wrote a little list of the things I think. You can't model what you can't do. And I think a lot of things in therapy, it's modeled. You model how to have a healthy conversation. You model how to receive a compliment. You model how to show empathy. And the work about the self is so difficult and complex because if you don't know who you are, if you don't, if you're really struggling with this, which is okay because we're humans too, we might have a hard time modeling it for the client. Um, I think we need to remember that when we express the self, we give the client permission to do the same. Authenticity only feels safe around authenticity. And I think that's such an important interaction between the selves that we need to keep in mind when we're in session. Um, yourself is never not present in a session is what I wrote. Whatever choices you make in therapy are not just shaping, you know, who you are as a therapist. It's also shaping who you become. I think there is a different level of responsibility there. And I think, you know, I understand the therapy is our job, but it is also something that is so very personal and we're so impacted by the work that we do. And I think it's really, really important to monitor how our self is being shaped and molded by our experience of being a therapist and then how our genuine self is interacting with the client's genuine self. 
I know that a lot of people might see the self as a liability, but I actually see it as the greatest strength. Um, and here's some questions that we can think about as therapists in a session, like how am I choosing to show up? Um, how is the way the client is showing up impacting me? Um, how is the way I show up impacting my client? Again, this is a relationship between the two selves. Uh, what is my freedom in this scenario as a therapist? And what is my responsibility as a therapist? And responsibility not just to myself, but also to the self of my client. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to um, share that really unique and I feel like sacred relationship. And again, emphasize that existential approach is well known for its anti-technique orientation. And it does prefer description, understanding, and exploration of reality. Um, and I think that that's what makes it incredibly unique. Um, so I am going to, I'm just looking at the time. I'm conscious of the time. Where did the time go? Um, I'm going to really fly over this slide really quickly, mostly because there's a lot of information out there about it if you're really curious. But the three prerequisites of self are attention, appreciation, and justice. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because if you want your client to build their sense of self, you need to be able to offer them all of these things. So attention is to genuinely see your client, to recognize who they are. It's not just about being noticed. It's not passive. It's full on recognition. And that is not always easy to do, especially as you're getting to know the client, but it's really, really important. The next step would be appreciation. So that's the step beyond acknowledgement. Once they're fully seen, we need to identify their inherent value and recognize it and voice it and make sure that there is a sense of appreciation for who they truly are, not just the fact that they did their homework or the fact that they set their boundary, which by the way, we are always super proud of, but I think really the appreciation of the self in a therapeutic setting is so important. And lastly, justice. This is making sure that you're keeping yourself in check, that you are treating your client with fairness and that you're not biased in any way. And then that you're also helping the client figure out how to treat themselves with justice, even if the world doesn't. And some of our clients are not treated justly at all in any context. And it's that injustice that makes them hard to lean into their sense of self. And that is so painful to watch. And my one thing is like, my warning is don't be part of that injustice. It's not going to be therapeutic. And also just really make sure that your client is offering that justice to themselves, even if the world isn't. Um, and it goes for the other two as well. Like make sure your client is offering attention and appreciation to themselves because that is a prerequisite, existential prerequisites to becoming who they are. So they can receive it from you, but if they don't receive it from themselves, it's still not going to be sufficient. So let's talk about how to spot self-loss. Narratives, patterns, reactions. Narratives that I watch out for a lot are when clients repeat things like, I don't know, to every question. I don't know if that's ever happened to anybody, but it's like, why do you think you did that? I don't know. What do you want? I don't know. And they're genuine. They're not trying to frustrate you, but the truth is that they don't know. And so believe them when they tell you there are certain clients that you can push back and be like, do you really not know? But if the narrative is, I don't know so often, that might just be true. Um, I also hear, you know, clients say like, who am I? Or like, who is the person that did that? Like, you know, they did something and then they go and like, who's the person that did that? That doesn't feel like me at all. Um, so, or someone who has, yeah, I mean, that's those are like the common narratives. And I just want to give you kind of a couple of each just to to have. 
uh, pattern, finding identity in relationships. That's a really common pattern for people who struggle to build an identity on their own. So they attach to someone else um, and try to make that relationship their identity. So looking at patterns of how they show up in relationships um, is a really, really great way to figure out if they're struggling with self-loss and then their reaction. So in a, authenticity in others might be really triggering for them because watching someone be authentic while you're avoiding your own, own authenticity is super triggering. Uh, when someone misunderstands them or doesn't see them accurately, their reaction is so strong. And that's because their own view of who they are it might be so fragile that not having an accurate mirror feels incredibly incredibly threatening so looking at narratives looking at patterns looking at reactions is a really really important cool so let's talk about three treatment strategies if we can even call them that I think when someone doesn't know who they are, we need to, what helps me is to separate it into three categories, the mental, the emotional, and the physical. And noticing the disconnect, for example, they might be saying that they're really happy or excited, but their body language tells you otherwise. That might indicate that they're not super aware of what their body is doing or the messaging that their body is sending. Um, you might also notice that, you know, they're telling you a story and that story is horrifying and they have absolutely no emotion or you know that their mind is so cluttered with relationships or habits and it's kind of like you know when you're really stressed and you're driving so you have to turn down the volume because you can't for some reason drive if the volume stays up in the car that's kind of what happens in our minds when there's just so much going on that we can't hear ourselves and can't concentrate on being authentic so dividing it into these three categories, I think, can be incredibly helpful um, and even getting your client to rank it, to go, OK, which part of me do I feel the most disconnected with? Because tackling all of them can feel inc incredibly overwhelming. So I think um, kind of ordering them. For me, I was really emotionally unaware and then I was say I had a strained relationship with my body and then there was the mental decluttering and what I love you know for body connection one of the techniques I use with my clients is saying something like okay pick a song that fits your mood so you might be angry you might be feeling sassy sexy upset happy and then move your body to it you shouldn't be in front of a mirror you might just want to stretch you might want to just kind of gently move. You might want to jump around. You might want to, I don't know, punch your pillow. It really doesn't matter what it is, but allow your body to speak to you. Allow your body to give you intel. Allow your body to have the seat at the table. I think the thing with the body disconnect is that oftentimes we think of our body just as something that we have and use and possess rather than something that we are. And when we don't understand the power and the insight that our body has, we often mistreat it. And so working with our body and working with the narratives and the beliefs we have about our body, like, is your client scared of their body? Does it not feel safe? Do they use it as a tool? All of these things can be incredibly helpful for your client to figure out how to connect to these different aspects of who they are. So let's talk about possible risks and challenges. Uh, mental health decline. So um, the work around identity is difficult and often involves the process of deconstruction as well as reconstruction. And depending on the client, as you are telling, as they're figuring out all the things that they're not, while not necessarily grasping all the things that they are at the same time or as maybe quickly enough, it can induce anxiety and depression and potential re-traumatization. So it's really, really delicate work. Um, imposition on clients. So I think 
one thing we need to be careful of with the sense of self is to really allow the client to be in the driver's seat and to never impose our own journey of self-development on them or to be that inaccurate warped mirror that um, makes them feel like they have to be someone other than who they are. And then finally, the triggers. So it can be incredibly triggering to work on this kind of work, especially if you're someone who's struggling with who they are and who isn't at some point. So I, I think monitoring our own triggers is incredibly important. And the final thing I want to say about self-loss is that there is such limited research out there. Um, I don't think this is a pathology. I don't think you should be in the DSM. I just think it's worthy of noting and paying attention to and seeing how it's impacting the way that we're showing up for our clients and the way that we're treating our clients. Um, and um, hopefully that will enrich our therapeutic experience as well as the experience of our clients. Woo, I think I did it. <laughs> you did it. You Woo. did it. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. This is this is something that is not talked about enough, and really, uh, you're engaging this audience um, in something that's really important. Thank you to the audience for being so engaged. Um, I love seeing the emojis. I think people might have oh, it. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and we are out of time, so we will go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much again, Sarah. Thank you, everyone, for being here and dealing with my jet lag. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone.